they'll be talking about uh, data-centric AI for tr uh, trustworthy AI. And again, I'm Alex. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Snorkel and also on faculty as, as an assistant professor at University of Washington. And um, I'll be pausing throughout the, the, uh, the presentation, try to make this at least artificially more conversational. I'll check out uh, in the QA or, or in the chat uh, if people have uh, questions, primarily the QA. So we'll try to make it more conversational. Also, I'll leave about five minutes at the end. Uh, but uh, let's jump into it now. So I'll start with uh, the first part of that title about uh, making an attempt at defining what we mean when we think uh, or we talk about data centric AI. And this, this title might sound a little bit, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, vacuous or, or, or tautological because, of course, uh, or at least, you know, in so much as when people say AI these days, they're often talking about machine learning. And indeed, today we're going to be talking about machine learning, of course. You know, if you've taken your machine learning 101 course, you know that ML uh, is you know, very much uh, dependent on, on data uh, and about data. But uh, really what we mean by data centric AI is, is about the development process and the workflow and what it looks like in the modern landscape and what it increasingly should be formalized and recognized as in the modern tooling landscape. So we'll go into that definition. So again, I'll, I'll paint the picture uh, in, in, in high level contrast. Obviously nothing is, is this simple or this black and white, but um, you know, at a very high level, we think of this in contrast to where a lot of the world was, say, five plus years ago before we started a lot of the work uh, back at Stanford AI Lab uh, that I'll talk about today in terms of, of the, the, the other kind of option, which is what we think of as model centric AI development. And the kind of, uh, you know, paradigmatic uh, model centric development cycle is one where the data and specifically the labeled training data that machine learning models learn from is kind of thought of as this you know, static exogenous asset that's outside of your process as a machine learning uh, person or a developer. I think of this as kind of the, the Kaggle or ImageNet kind of, uh, of uh, you know, form of machine learning where you, you, know, you start your ML process as a data scientist or a, a machine learning engineer by you know, clicking download on the data set or on the benchmark uh, you know, data set or you know, downloading the file from your colleague and, you know, who's labeled some training data for you. And you think of this as kind of outside of your development process. And, effectively as a, a you know a more or less static asset for your development cycle and you go about making your iterations your interventions effectively programming your machine learning model by uh, iterating on the model itself by changing features by changing uh, algorithms uh, uh, and and bespoke you know building and, and modifying bespoke model architectures and this work on the model is is the center of your development cycle and in a, a lot of areas uh, today and and um, I'll give some examples later on. What we've seen is a shift to where the center of gravity is in your development cycle. So today, models are increasingly, you know, both standardized and accessible out in the open source, um, increasingly push button, increasingly powerful and effective at, 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 you know, classical grand challenge tasks, but also increasingly data hungry and increasingly black box. And effectively what this does and what it has done over the last couple of years is in many, many settings, far from all, but in many settings, it shifts the center of your development cycle over to the data, to labeling, shaping, augmenting, slicing, relabeling, sampling, and managing the data as the primary thing that you're doing with your time as a developer when you're actually developing and building ML and AI systems. And uh, you know, uh, even more to the point, as the kind of arbiter of success or failure in terms of deploying models. So again, it's not an either or. Clearly, successful AI development requires both models and data. Again, with the tautological statements, but you know, just to get things uh, started on the right foot here, we'll state the obvious stuff. Um, but again, it, it's not either or, it's rather a shift in where the focus of development in many, many settings is. And it really does fundamentally change how we actually formalize the development process, how we think about developing and deploying AI. Another way to phrase it is probabilistically, for ML fans in the audience, you, know, you might uh, imagine, you know, pull a random uh, a company that's, uh, or, or team or, or lab that's uh, doing stuff with AI today and ask them what they're stuck on and where they're spending their time. And in the model centric world, 99% of the time, they'd say, you know, finding the right features or building the right model architecture or implementing the training uh, algorithm. And today, you know, a large proportion of the time, they'll stay stuck on the data or working on the data or labeling the data or waiting for the data to get labeled, et cetera. So this is what we mean by this broad shell skiff, and it opens up some very fascinating questions and how you should you know, think about actually developing and supporting the development of, of AI today.
So some of the uh, uh, you know, ideas that we've started with, and, and uh, back in the academic days, these were strictly uh, speaking hypotheses. And now uh, at the company, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, someone put in the word principles, but whether you call them hypotheses, like I still often think of them, or principles, you know, the key ideas are, are, are threefold that I'll talk about in, in this talk, and that um, anchor a lot of the work that, we've, uh, that, that myself and colleagues have done over the years, both on the academic and, and commercial side. So first and foremost, it's this idea that I just kind of previewed there, which is that a lot of AI development has shifted to centering around the data and, and specifically workflows have shifted to iterating on the data even more so than iterating on the model. Um, number two, that if data is going to be the center of an iterative development workflow and process, it, the interface to this, to, to, to you know, modifying this now first class object of the data has to be programmatic, can't just be about you know, manual, uh, you know, individual data point labeling. And finally, uh, data-centric AI needs to include the person who actually knows how to label and manage the data, namely the subject matter expert, um, as a first-class participant in the loop. So I'll talk about all, all of uh, you know, these principles and, and how they translate into a lot of the work that we've done, and also try to map them to how this can potentially enable a much more trustworthy, uh, auditable, governable, um, and transparent AI development and deployment process. And so to anchor on that part of uh, of the, the the talk and the discussion today, you know, I'll kind of go through four uh, very high level points that uh, you know are at least some things that you'd you'd care about in defining trustworthy and, and and auditable and governable AI, and also points that we'll talk about in light of this this kind of model centered to data centric AI shift. Uh, the first is the ability to actually govern and audit the data that AI models learn from, right? And again. Uh, I'm effectively just meaning machine learning models today. Um, and, and clearly, you know, machine learning models are, you know, if we think about a standard supervised learning or empirical risk minimization setting, you know, ML models are trying to fit to the, 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 late, the, the training data. So, you know, the data is extremely important in terms of actually governing and auditing the models themselves. Um, uh, again, kind of obvious statement. Number two, being able to explain AI decisions and errors. And, you know, there's a ton of, you know, there's a, a huge uh, area of work, uh, as we know from our our, our, our gracious sponsors here and from you know, many academic uh, communities springing up around this, this topic. But uh, I'll focus today on the part of being able to explain the data uh, and actually trace back to the data that leads to certain AI decisions and or errors. The ability to actually correct biases in, in, in AI or ML models, um, ideally in a systematic fashion. And the, uh, you know, the requirement of actually having a close link between the subject matter experts who you know, know what to look for and know how to actually define in a practical sense what trustworthy AI in their domain and their data set means with the data scientists leading the deployments. And again, the theme that will surprise, surprise anchor on for this talk is that um, all of these really center on the data, the training data that AI models learn from. So I'll, I'll uh, step through uh, these kind of high level principles. And again, then we'll talk about how they map to these ideas of, of, of trustworthy AI. So first, you know, principle or hypothesis of data-centric AI is that uh, AI development today often centers around uh, the data, meaning it centers around iterating on and effectively programming the data as a way to, to build and modify and, and iterate on AI applications or ML models. So to go in here just a, with a little bit more depth, um, and this will be a, a very opinionated and abbreviated tour, but just to quickly go through, you know, if you looked at model-centric development, and again, just to go into a little bit more depth of what, what, I, what I mean when I say that, you know, key operations you think about often have to do with effectively uh, defining or, or, or often you know, kind of sub-selecting and reducing the complexity of, of model architectures, right? So typically, this would revolve around what's often called feature engineering. And again, you know, I don't, past tense is oversimplifying. In many domains, this is still the heart of, of the work, and it's always a part of the work. Um, but you know, it used to be the number one thing that anyone doing machine learning would be doing, which is uh, you know picking out the actual uh, features that are fed in as as basic inputs to the model. Uh, the second is is you know then defining the model architectures, which you know were often handcrafted for uh, you know the data at hand to encode basic assumptions. You know, a lot more reliance on explicitly defined generative model structures that effectively encode priors about how the data is distributed and how the problem looks. And then, you know, bespoke algorithms and infrastructure setups to actually, you know, uh, 
train those bespoke model architectures uh, and, and, and deploy them. And then, you know, again, staying very high level here, you know, we, we've seen over the last five plus years, this, this major tectonic shift in at least, you know, a lot of the mainstream models that are used from these, uh, you know, explicitly defined and manually architected models that relied on manually architected features to, um, you know, now widespread use of, of representation or deep learning models that actually learn their own features, you know, obviate a lot of those tasks uh, with standard architectures and automatically learn features, but uh, that are also, you know, far more difficult to modify in any human parsable way or understand for that matter, and far more data hungry. So it's worth noting that, you know, not just before we get to the challenges, again, another really exciting trend that we see is that models, um, you know, are, are increasingly converging to standard architectures that are increasingly effectively commoditized and available out in the open source, right? If you're following machine learning, uh, uh, you know, uh, Twitter and recent ML papers, you see, you know, another, uh, another paper about how, you know, X classic task over, you know, why data modality is now, you know, uh, uh, you know, a new state of the art has been achieved uh, using a transformer architecture, for example, or, 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 you know, a while back, it was the convergence of showing that, you know, data modalities beyond image could be handled by convolutional neural nets and stuff like that. But either way, you see this, this great convergence of all these diverse tasks and data types and problem settings all being handled by these, these kind of standard uh, model architectures, which is incredibly exciting. But uh, what happens in, in, as a result is that, you know, as these models become more standardized, more accessible out in the open source, they also become less accessible to actually understand and modify, right? So models today are not, uh, you know, really arranged in, in a way such that, you know, most anyone can, can say, okay, I see my models making this type of error. I know where to go and, and fix it so that it does better. So they're, they're pretty, you know, a black box, even as they're very performant and accessible. And of course, they're increasingly data hungry. So uh, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of the newest uh, deep learning models uh, have kind of broken old statistical, uh, you know, generalization or machine learning theory, but still at a rough level, you know, the back of the envelope, if you have a more complex model, meaning more free parameters that it needs to learn how to tune or more, more knobs effectively, it's going to need more label training data to fit to and actually, you know, learn a robust representation. So these models increasingly rely on huge volumes of, of you know, carefully labeled training data. And there are lots of ways uh, to, to kind of, you know, reduce this burden, but for, um, you know, the large majority of settings, especially when you have, you know, real world data sets that are not, you know, the same as web text and don't just instantly get solved by uh, transfer learning or pre-trained model, uh, or pre-trained or zero shot models, you know, you, you need a lot of uh, new data to be labeled to actually fuel these, these models. So here's where we'll take a, a, pop, a step to kind of pop back up to the level of, of you know, the main uh, theme of this, this, uh, this, this conference, which is trustworthy AI, and talk a little bit about, you know, where this uh, data-centric reality that is so dependent on what's often manually labeling, uh, uh, often manually labeled training data that fuels these models, you know, where that raises, you know, incredible challenges for, for, for governable and ethical AI. And again, there's lots of parts, you know, I'm sure you've, you've heard uh, talks here today about just, you know, the, the, the huge set of challenges around interpreting and explaining why these complex modern uh, deep learning model architectures make certain decisions. Um, but today we'll, you know, again, in, or in this talk, obviously, you know, focus squarely on the data and problems that arise from, from that. And so, you know, staying at a very high level, you know, one major issue is that these models rely on massive quantities of, of uh, labeled training data. And when they're labeled by hand, often, you know, by, you know, outsourced uh, uh, fleets of annotators, you know, actually understanding how to govern or audit or, or explore these labeled training data sets is, 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 you know, both theoretically and intuitively as hard or even harder of a problem than the problem you're trying to solve by labeling data to train a model in the first place. It's not to say it's impossible, but it's extremely difficult to actually say anything about what's going on in these hand labeled training data sets. You know, kind of flowing down from that principle, it's really difficult to trace back, um, you know, why a model actually learned something and where the in the training data uh, this originated from. There, there is some great work on this, but it's still a very challenging problem since models, you know, learn global statistics of a of a data set in general. Not uh, so, so it's hard to trace back, you know, 
you know, if a model is incorrect or it's biased, you know, where did it learn that from in this massive hand labeled training data set? Very difficult to do that. By the same token, very difficult to identify and correct biases when they're effectively projected from, you know, lots of manual annotators onto these massive hand labeled data sets. And finally, a lot of how this actually happens in practice is kind of a throw it over the wall model of, S of, of annotator or subject matter expert and data scientist collaboration. In other words, a lot of how this type of AI is done is that there's some you know, outsourced or, 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 or you know, in-house but very separate and often very labor intensive effort to label this training data. It then gets thrown over the wall to the data scientists or the machine learning engineers. And there's very little contact between the people who actually know about the data and labeled it and the people who are training the model which is you know, a surefire recipe to lead to, to problems in, in trustworthy and ethical uh, AI. So you know, in a nutshell, you know, without an understanding of how and why the training data was labeled and an understanding that's actually you know, abstracted away from the rationales of individual annotators over individual data points, it's really difficult to understand the how and why of, 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 of you know, why a machine learning model um, you know, make certain decisions or does certain things and then you know much less actually correct it okay so that leads to our, our second idea and this has been a core of a lot of the work that um you know myself and colleagues at stanford and, and now at a range of institutions UW and, and others are working on around uh making the uh management and labeling and 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 manipulation of training data more programmatic um, about this, this, you know, you know, well, taking a step back and saying, why, 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 why the push to make, uh, um, this interface programmatic. And again, pretty, pretty simple rationale. When you have this data centric AI environment where models are, you know, centrally dependent on huge quantities of labeled data, then, um, you know, you need, if you're going to do it by hand, armies of human labelers effectively. And for many folks uh, and many organizations, this is just a non-starter. You have often have you know, private data sets that can't be easily shipped out to, you know, um, you know, outsource labelers. You often have data sets, you know, think in medicine, in finance, in in uh, you know, science, and I, mean, I think most areas of, of the world, you actually need some specially trained experts to label your data. And also in, in most settings, you have data sets that are changing, both the input data coming in, the output objectives of what you want your model to do, necessitating frequent relabeling. So even you know, the largest organizations in the world, many of whom we've gotten to, to work and, and publish papers with and, and, and talk about this problem with, are stuck trying to get this data labeled to fuel these new, these new models. So I'll give one example, just, just to have a little bit of, of, of you know, hard and, and peer reviewed numbers thrown at this this talk track, although I'll, I'll mostly skip skip over um, the details. But this is a series of papers that we did on some uh, deployments to the Stanford hospital system and the VA healthcare system, uh, motivated by low resource uh, uh, hospital systems where they're just overflowing with, with a queue of, of um, you know, cases to be read, think chest x-rays or head CTs, et cetera. So the idea here is to, uh, you know, or the idea was to train machine learning models to do triaging, basically to understand should something be urgently read or can it sit in the queue? Either way, all that this is, and certainly in the, in, in the context of this talk, is an example of a kind of classic data-centric um, you know, classification problem. Uh, and just, again, to, to let the numbers speak, here, building the model and actually trying out about five to 10 different model architectures that were state-of-the-art at the time only took our collaborators you know, a day or two. And there was under a point of, of, of kind of spread between you know, the best model and the 10th best model that they tried in terms of the end metric RSA that we're, that we're optimizing for. Conversely, across applications, it took eight to 14 person months to label the training data because we had to rely in this case on, you know, specially trained doctors at the Stanford healthcare system with access to the data, uh, carefully labeling the data. And the difference between a little bit of that and the full amount was, you know, uh, you know an order of magnitude or greater uh, uh, than the difference in what, which model architecture. So again, this is just another example of how not only is, is you know, you know, AI today or machine learning today often blocked on the data, but that data is really the center of where you get the best, you know, the biggest leverage and where these applications are made successful or not. Um, and again, we've talked about this. We're a little short on time, so I'll kind of run through. I want to leave time for questions. But again, you know, this immediately raises questions of, 
if we're manually labeling this data, how do we inspect or correct biases when you have, you know, a number of annotators over hundreds of thousands or millions of data points labeling them one by one? How do we govern or audit a big pile of manually labeled training data? How do we trace the lineage of model errors, et cetera? And so, you know, I'm going to just give a only, you know, a very brief treatment of, of a lot of the approaches that we've worked on over the years, both uh, at Stanford and now at other uh, uh, places like UW, but also uh, through the Snorkel company. At a very high level, one of the core ideas is, is the programmatic labeling and more broadly management of, of data. And again, from the data-centric AI perspective, this is really just saying, look, if data is the central object that you iterate on, that you effectively program to, to program your AI and ML models, there needs to be some kind of abstracted you know, programmatic interface to it for it to be practical. And from the trustworthy AI perspective, you know, raising this, this labeling and management of the training data that effectively determines what the ML model, or directly, deter directly and explicitly determines what the machine learning model does is you know, a step change in terms of the ability to actually govern, audit, and, and trust. So I'll briefly mention, you know, a lot of this is coming from uh, the Snorkel project and, and now uh, the team's all at the Snorkel company. But just talking about the research side of things, you know, this was a, a, you know, a, a project still ongoing uh, with my co-founder and former advisor, Chris Ray, over at Stanford and now at other places, 50 plus peer reviewed publications, um, uh, you know, lots more if you're interested in the gory details. But at a very high level, and I'll talk about the um, commercial platform Snorkel flow that we build today through the company, but I'm really just using this as an example of a programmatic data centric AI approach. Uh, basic idea at a high level is, you know, being able to rapidly iterate on your data, uh, starting with programmatically labeling and managing it, cleaning up the results, because in a nutshell, programmatic labeling is far more effective and trustworthy and has all these other benefits, but it's also messier or what formally we often call weak supervision. So using theoretically grounded algorithmic approaches to clean up that noise or, or weakness in the supervision, then training models, and then you know, closing the loop. And the key idea is not some kind of push button auto magic solution, but rather to make uh, AI development about rapid data centric iteration um, that looks more like any other type of software development and doesn't look like you know uh, months and months of just waiting for people to manually label data for every uh, iteration of your model. So, um, can I think I, um, I'll, I'll aim to leave a, a couple minutes at the end. I don't see any Q and A so far, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna assume I have, you know, most of the time. But if, if folks are are interested in taking more time, if I see, um, if I see a Q and A coming in, I'll, I'll I'll stop a bit earlier. Otherwise, I'll kind of go to the end. So at a high level. Um, you know, basic ideas here, and I'm sorry, the indentation got, got killed here, but I promise I, I, I know about indentation in, in writing Python code. Um, uh, you know, basic ideas is very simple to high level, very semantically simple. Um, you know, write a function that takes in a data point and either labels it or abstains. So very semantically minimal idea here being that this labeling function idea can uh, serve as a, a an abstraction and an input port for all sorts of types of of, of noisy or weak supervision, anything from heuristics or patterns to other models, to knowledge bases, to uh, potentially untrustworthy annotators, et cetera. Um, and then a lot of uh, what we've worked on over the years is, is basically saying, look, if you can label data with you know, a bunch of functions, you can uh, label data in a fraction of the time. For example, to close the loop on that, on that um, radiology triaging example, we went from eight person months to eight hours to get the same level of performance. So there can be very, you know, significant and eye popping, but, you know, you know, very much non magical changes from just writing down what you know about the problem as code rather than manually labeling huge volumes of data. Um, and we'll talk about some of the impacts on, you know, ability to actually trust and inspect and audit the resulting system. But uh, well, what's the trade-off? No such thing as a free lunch. The, the trade-off or the challenge rather is that, you know, taking a bunch of functions that label data uh, with some unknown accuracies and potential correlations and overlaps and disagreements and incomplete coverage uh, is, you know, not going to be 100% accurate, not going to cover all the data. This is what we often refer to as uh, weak supervision. And a lot of the work on the Stanford side over the years has been about, you know, building theory and, and algorithms for uh, 
reweighting and combining these sources uh, with guarantees and basically modeling this weaker supervision so it can be used to train models. Um, so if you can, you know, uh, model this weaker programmatic supervision, you can clean it up and then you can use it to train models that actually generalize beyond it, right? So one way of looking at this very high level is that you're taking as input, you know, something that looks more like expert knowledge, you know, think back to expert systems of the 80s, just direct specification, direct auditable, explainable specification of knowledge, and you're bridging it with the power of modern, you know, statistical approaches to generalize, um, to get higher coverage uh, and, and, and cover the long tail of complex data distributions. You also get some, some neat effects uh, that are both empirically and theoretically observed in, in, in many, you know, um, uh, things that we've reported on over the years where you can now pipe more unlabeled data through these programmatic uh, labeling functions and actually get increases in model performance that asymptotically approaches the performance improvements you'd get if you just manually labeled more data, but with obviously a fixed manual effort because you're just writing one set of labeling functions and just putting greater volume of unlabeled data through it. Um, and then finally, the main idea is that since your data is labeled and managed by code, you can go back and iterate just like you would on any other software, uh, uh, you know, development process, rather than having to, you know, beg your subject matter expert annotator friends to, you know, label another, you know, 100,000 chest x-rays or legal documents every time you want to iterate on your model. I'll briefly also mention, uh, just as a teaser, and again, uh, lots of uh, academic and, and other stuff that we've published about this, that you know, data-centric AI is obviously a lot more than just labeling. And in particular, some of the things that, that, that we've personally looked at, um, uh, things like uh, uh, data augmentation, which is uh, where you uh, apply transformations to your data set to artificially generate more copies of it, more data, and, and make distributions and models trained on them more robust. Uh, what we've called slicing functions. So the idea of, um, you know, partitioning your data set. So your model knows what are the important subs, you know, minority subsets of it to fit to. So there's all this broader scope of not just labeling your data, but augmenting it, shaping it, slicing it, sampling it, et cetera, that go into data centric AI and obviously just scratching the surface here. But um, I, I do want to conclude on a couple of ideas around, you know, the main topic here, which is around, you know, trustworthy AI. And so going back to those points I emphasize, and again, I'm, I'm going to stay very high level here because, you know, almost at the end, but um, I'll just wrap up since I don't see any Q&A. You know, a couple of, of, of important ideas here that are enabled by this, this uh, ability to programmatically label data. You know, first, the idea that uh, you have a very direct way now to govern and audit your uh, your training data and, and therefore your models. You can go back and just look and see what what functions labeled the data. And uh, you can govern and audit using a lot of the same tools and practices that you use to govern and audit code. You get a new kind of tool in your toolkit for explainability. Again, many, many things to do around explaining why models make certain decisions or have certain pathologies or errors. But now you have an extra toolkit to actually be able to go and you know, understand at a programmatic and explainable and inspectable level what, you know, taught my model to do a certain thing and how can I correct it. And you also have the ability to actually correct biases systematically, because at least the biases that can come from how your data is labeled are now rendered by code. And if there's some bias in how they're labeling data, you can go and just change the code. So I'll wrap up there now because I know I'm at time, uh, but hopefully that gives a little bit of a tour of um, you know, how uh, some of these new ideas around data centric and programmatic AI intersect with uh, some of these, you know, incredibly important and, and you know, relevant and pressing concerns about trustworthy and governable AI. Thank you, Alex. Um, a lot of meat in what you just uh, went through, and I'm sure the audience appreciates that. I actually, I think we have time um, for just one quick question um, that occurred to me as I was watching your presentation. I think our audience would like to, to maybe hear uh, it feels like based on some of what you've um, shown is that you're actually also suggesting and developing a process for data centric AI development, which is, which is great. So not just the tools, but the fact that there's a process that you might want to follow. Um, do you have suggestions or tips on people getting started down this path that want to kind of get more involved in that? Yeah. I mean, so there, there's some great stuff out there, you know, um, 
shameless plug, we ran a, a little, uh, you know, workshop um, uh, with a bunch of, you know, very similar type group, you know, some, some industry folks, some, some academic folks um, uh, that was uh, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. There's some great stuff from uh, a lot of folks out there. Andrew Ring is putting some stuff out there. We have a lot of stuff out in the open source. Actually, there was just an O'Reilly book that some, fo- uh, some, some collaborators at Microsoft wrote about uh, the kind of snorkel week supervision approaches, which um, actually just came out uh, this week. So there's lots of materials out there. Um, you know, this stuff is, is it's, it's in, you know, some, some of the, the, the Stanford course materials, thanks to my, co- uh, my, my, my advisor, Chris, and others. Um, so lots of materials that are out there. In terms of getting started on it, I think the, um, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, some motion recently that, uh, you know, some, some collaborators that I work with of putting together more benchmark data sets, more standard assets, because it, it is a little trickier to get started. A lot of this stuff is, you know, um, requires working with subject matter experts. And so it kind of breaks down that wall. It's very convenient to just be able to go to, you know, Kaggle and download a data set and never interface with the messy real world data and real world domain experts that actually have to go into it. So, you know, we're working on, on you know, building equivalent benchmarks, but, um, you know, hopefully that'll also lower the barrier. Awesome. Um, Thank you. I, I think we should probably wrap things up there, Alex. Awesome. Um, really appreciate it. If you want to stop sharing, um, my colleague uh, Henry will come on board and we'll uh, just wrap up the day then. So thank you again, Wonderful. Alex. Well, thank you so much for having me again and, and, and uh, for the great questions. 